today. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. All right. The way we're going to do our uh, Facebook today is uh, we're going to not be doing it live, but uh, it'll show up on the site at the ministry. Be sure to uh, get it when, when you see it there uh, and uh, send it on to your friends, and that way uh, the word can get out. We're working on making that better. So um, right now, let's just go ahead and turn our hearts toward the word of God for a while. Hey, I've got something really good to say today about how Jesus is passing by, all right? Uh, Jesus is passing by. It's important for us to understand that not everybody recognizes him when he passes by. It's important that you open up your heart and that you are very prepared to respond properly when you know he's passing by. Now, we're going to look at a scripture together today, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Okay? Right, come on, let's look there. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 9. Everybody get your Bibles, and let's go there together. Okay? And it fell on a day that Elisha passed by Shunem, where, where was a great woman. Everybody say great woman. And she constrained him to eat bread, and so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. He turned there to eat bread. Verse 9. And he said unto her husband, she said, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. So Elisha was a very powerful prophet. All the way through the Bible, you probably heard about this man, how he did great, amazing miracles. He was the protege of the great prophet Elijah. Remember, he's the one that received the double portion anointing. And this woman noticed that Elisha was passing by her on a regular basis. And you can look at there in the King James it says continually. That means consistently or regularly he was passing by. And verse 10, she says to her husband, let's build on to our house and make a room for this man of God. So she was saying, let's accommodate or let's make room for the miraculous in our lives. She's saying, let's make room for a miracle in our family because the miracles and the mighty acts of God flows through this man. You see, Elisha represents the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say amen? amen? He represents also the miracles of God and how uh, the miracles of God was passing by them on a regular basis. But this shows us that just because, listen, the power of the Holy Spirit and the miracles of God are passing by, even on a regular basis. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily something that will benefit you. Please hear me what I'm about to say right here. Okay, so this, this man represented the moving of God, the power of the Spirit. And after this man and woman built onto their house, prepared a room, moved in a bedroom suit... <laughs> Made sure he had everything he needed. The Bible says that Elisha turned in there. That means he went there and made sure he stayed there because they made a special place for him. How many of y'all know that, that that family got blessed because they did this? Amen. So turn with me to a few scriptures and notice the pattern of what we're going to be talking about today. In Luke chapter 18, verse 37. In Luke 18, 37. <clears throat> when Jesus entered into Jericho, a blind man heard the multitudes in turmoil and uproar. And the people told him what was going on. And they said in verse 37, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. 
Now, it's amazing to me how it is that Jesus is passing by changes everything for somebody who responds to him. But if you don't respond adequately, he just passes by and nothing of any real significance takes place. But for this man, the blind man, something of great significance takes place because he responds to Jesus when he passes by. Are you with me today? Let's look at Luke chapter 9, verse 1. <clears throat> Luke chapter, I'm sorry, 19, verse 1. Let's go there together. Luke 19, 1. So after Jesus heals the blind man entering into Jericho, he goes out of Jericho. Look what it says in verse 19. And Jesus entered and he passed through Jericho. Now, I don't know how many other people received a significant touch from Jesus passing by other than the blind man. But it sounds like Jesus entered into Jericho. Just on the outskirts of Jericho when they heard the commotion, the blind man gets healed. Jesus walks right on through all the, the, the marketplaces and the city and just passes it right through. And the Bible says, and passed through Jericho. Did you hear me? Now, in Mark chapter 6, verse 48. Mark chapter 6, verse 48. The Bible tells us that the disciples were in the boat. And Jesus saw them. Toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary, the Bible says. And about the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came unto them walking on the water. Isn't that something? He sees them rowing like crazy. They're, on, they're panicking. They're working hard. That's what toiling means. Rowing, the wind is not cooperating, pushing them in the direction they don't want to go, so they have to resist it in order to get to where they're going, maybe to shore just to get away so they can get some kind of relief from the paddling and even rescue their lives. And Jesus is just having fun walking out there on the water. <laughs> hey, have you all seen, seen that movie where Jesus is running on the water with that guy? What's it called? The what? The shack. The shack. Man, I loved it when that guy was running on the water with Jesus. It was if you haven't seen that movie, you would really get blessed. Jesus is running on the water, and a guy is running beside him, and it's just one of the most amazing scenes ever done by movie makers, in my opinion. Jesus is walking on the water having fun. But it's amazing what happens here because as he came unto them walking on the sea, the Bible says he would have passed by them. Do you see that? <clears throat> He would have passed by them. So I want you to notice these few verses that we talked about. One of them, Jesus was passing by. Another one, he passed through. Another one, he would have passed them by. And then the scripture in 2 Kings that we saw about Elisha, he is passing by constantly and on a regular basis. Amen. <clears throat> so, where two are gathered, the Lord is there in the midst of us, right? The Bible says that. The Lord is present right now in this place. For sure, he is here. Can somebody say amen? He is here. Don't see him with your natural eyes, but according to this word, we believe it's true. We many times sense it in our spirit man that's born again. We know what we're talking about today is so Jesus, his spirit, by the Holy Spirit, is present in this room right now. Amen. You see, it's not good enough to know his presence and his power is here today. God's word is showing us this, that even though his presence and his power is among us and passing by us on a regular basis, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily benefiting us. How many other people did Jesus walk past in Jericho and only the blind man responded? 
I don't know if anyone else responded. You see, we have to make room for the movement of God, just like this man and woman did for the prophet Elisha. Make room for the moving of God. We have to make room for the miraculous to move in our lives. Amen? Amen. That means we have got to open our hearts and be ready for it, looking for it, expecting, and at any moment do whatever it takes for you to properly respond in order to benefit from the moving of God. Can somebody say amen? Amen. You know what? There are so many people in churches who are so cold, so distant, so stuck in the mud, so traditionalized, so religiousized, that when God begins to move, they're more concerned about what somebody might think of them (laughs) than to actually do what it takes to respond and get free. That's a real stronghold right there. And I think we need to wake up to make sure that we don't fall into that boat of people. Amen? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, we can put that on the screen. You don't have to go to it. It says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. <clears throat> In the Bible, when God created the world, He said, Let there be light. But then the Bible says that the Spirit of God moved. Everybody say, Moved. Moved upon the face of the waters. Notice the Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God is always moving. The Spirit of God is moving even right now as I'm speaking. And it's going to be up to you to decide what you're going to receive while I'm ministering, what you're going to receive in a service, what's going to, uh, how much you're going to be benefiting from this uh, time together. You see, the Holy Spirit is not a pond. He's not a pool. He is definitely not a swamp. The Bible refers to the Holy Spirit, listen, as a river. Amen. And another place he's referred to in the scripture when it comes to water as a fountain springing up. Hallelujah. So, so the, the, the Spirit of God is moving. He's not stalemated. He's not boring. He's not stuck in a rut. It's people who just experience his passing by that don't jump in to the river. Now, I've noticed some people, they just like and they draw a line of what a service can do in their life. They'll draw a line, they'll see the moving of God, and they'll just sit back and only go so far, see even some people getting blessed more than them, and they just take a deep breath and a sigh and say, isn't this wonderful? Isn't this nice? And they're satisfied with that type of experience rather than jumping into the river and getting, for instance, their healing. For their body or their emotional healing or the things they've been worried about, lay it on the altar for him to get to take so they don't have to be concerned about it anymore. About the answer that they're they're looking for, actually take it by faith and go out with something different in their heart that takes them into a whole new realm of winning and victory than what they had when they came in. If you're just satisfied for just sitting back, watching and enjoying the nice flow, the Christmas lights, the happy music, some people just smiling, and that's all you're looking for. I'm just telling you what, church get, is nice, but it gets boring after a while. Come on. You're going to have to respond to God more and better than you've been doing before. The Lord put this in my heart because I remember days when people used to be more responsive. I haven't changed. Every now and then, I get tempted to change because you can settle into a nice program. And there's so many churches now that are satisfied for a, with a nice program, and it's getting crowds, but yet lives are not really being changed. Oh, they got a schedule, they got a time frame, they're out of here, and I mean one hour, you're out. Even though you might get a sermonette and keep everybody in their bassinet, they're still out. But they're not growing. Amen? I'm telling you that when you come to church, you're going to need to open your heart and get ready to respond and hang 
your life on every word this Bible says to you to change you and lift you up and get you out of the stuff you're in and take you to a higher place. Listen, your life is going past you, and you really don't have any time to waste. But just having a ho-hum, nice spiritual experience, but not any dramatic, significant change is not what Jesus came and gave his life for you to have. Come on, I don't know how to say it no better than that. God wants you to be ready for a significant change. Don't you know that he would like for things to be different for you, the things that's bothering you, the things you're praying about? You can pray about, but yet never take a stand, never take a real stand, never really move forward, never do anything significant to, to show that this is something that is the end of and you're walking into a different realm and just take a firm, they say, stand about it. I'm going to talk about what that means here in just a minute, all right? But uh, a river is constantly moving, and you've got to get in contact with the river in order to benefit from the river. Can somebody say amen? See, you, let me ask you this. Do you know what you'll get out of this service today? Exactly what you put into it. You see, we know Jesus, and his awesome power is passing by, and we know he is here. We've established that. But the question is, will you open up your heart and make room for him and connect with him in such a way that it really benefits you, that it really changes you? See, we have the ability to cause the moving of God to pass by or e even flow through us or pass us by. So we can let the river just pass us by or flow through us. I think the river... In the Bible, which is called the river of life, is going to be a fun thing to, to experience. I don't know if you thought about this, but I've, every now and then think about stuff I'm going to do when I get to heaven. And one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to play in the river. I say, I'm going to play in the river. The Bible talks about this river. This river is called the river of life. I've heard people, there's been a few people in the past few decades, that God has allowed to have certain experiences that we haven't heard of before, such as death experiences, and come back and tell about it. Well, on several of them, I've heard about those people who get into the river. The river of life. <laughs> when you get into a river right now, it just kind of goes around you. You're in the water, but a river of life means this water ain't going to just go around you. It's going to go through you. <laughs> this thing going to energize you. It's going to make you feel like running. It's going to make you feel like dancing, leaping, shouting, and everything else because God's got so much joy for us that we have not tasted of in heaven, but yet he wants us to have more of it here on the earth. You need to think about jumping into the river now. <laughs> Amen. Are you hearing me? Jump into the river now. So many sicknesses and diseases would be short-lived if you jump into the river right now. Well, I'm not used to church like that. I'm, listen, I know some of us have come from liturgical backgrounds. Some of us have come from such proper backgrounds that we don't know how to do anything differently sometimes. It's unusual. It may even feel extremely awkward. But I'm telling you, we've got to get past that into a new day, a new realm of how God wants things done that's new to you but not new to the Bible. Amen? Now, how about it if this guy, the blind man, would have just sat there? Well, I think I can get healed if I can just let know Jesus pass by. He didn't do it that way. You know, you've got to get to the place where enough is enough. But we tolerate stuff, put up with stuff. We'll get over it. Time will heal. You know, I believe this, that, the other, you know, but I don't have to respond now. You know, the devil don't want you to ever do something now or today. He wants you to always put it off. He's a procrastinator. You see, God is a now God, and he wants you to respond in the now day. But listen, the devil don't want now to ever come to you. He don't want you to ever say, you know, this is a good enough time to stand up and claim my healing. You know, you got to go to Benny Hinn. you got to have a, a moving of the music just right, the choir of two or 300 people singing just right, and all the music just right, and all the atmosphere just right. How about 
the atmosphere when Jesus was just passing by a busy street and the man sitting there said, I want to see. Where is the music then? Where is the 200 member choir? Where is all the Christmas tree lights then? It didn't matter because the man knew Jesus was passing by. Well, we have got to grab hold of the fact that we need to be more responsive because I think we're missing out because we're being too reserved. Amen. We're missing out because we're being too reserved. There's so much emphasis on being so polished in a church service that God didn't have room to move. I don't want to see the day that our praise and worship team gets so polished that they have no room to sing a song of the Spirit and break out and prophesy every once in a while or let's all dance and sing that song again until we have a breakout. And I hope it gets wilder. Honestly, I do. Because it ain't nobody here holding up nothing but just a demonic force trying to keep us from going to the next level. And I'm speaking to him right now and saying he's coming down off of this ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. I want the blessed times to come to this, this uh, church. I want the times of anointing and the seasons of refreshing, the times of refreshing to blow upon this ministry and upon this church and upon your soul and bless your life more than ever before. Amen. But in order for that to happen, it's going to take more than one or two of us who are willing to jump out there and lay hold of God when he's passing by. Amen. Here's the truth, y'all. The truth is this. Need does not obligate God. Need does not obligate God. But God, I got a need, and I'm just trusting that you're going to meet that need. Well, one of the blind men says, well, Jesus is passing by. He knows I got a need. I got a need. And since I got a need, God's supposed to help me because I got a need. Just because you have a need does not obligate God. What obligates God is your response in faith to help resolve your need because he's not going to force himself on you and he's not going to just allow compassion alone though he cares about your hurt he cares about your pain <clears throat> he feels your infirmity he is not obligated because he doesn't feel the pull he's, he's looking for the pull what I mean by that is the blind man pulled on Jesus the woman with the issue of blood pulled on his anointing, said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be healed. She had to do something. And I don't know why we think we can just sit quietly by and God just do stuff for us and we just let years go by and not really think that we have to do anything of any significance to respond. We have got to wake up to what happens with God and how he expects things to work because he's got a system of how he works and he ain't changing it for you. Amen. If you want to get in on the benefits of God, you're going to have to cooperate with his ways of doing things. He, is, he has come to us as far as he can come to us and done for us all he can do for us until we cooperate with his way of doing things and then he responds even more. Are you getting me? Yes, All right. So, so um, let's, let's look what I got here. As long as you stand by, sit by, you can be passed by. That's what I put here. As long as you stand by and sit by, you can be passed by. Now, years ago when I was in a church, we sang songs out of the hymn books that I'm still figuring out at my age what the Dickens is about. I'm trying to figure out what it, what it was. I can't, I can't understand. I had a lot of misunderstanding. Bringing in the sheeps. It's supposed to be sheaves, you know. Well, I thought, you know, we're bringing in the sheep. Gladly the cross I bear instead of gladly the cross I bear. You know, I don't know. Love, lipped, and tea. When nothing else can help, love, lipped, and tea. Then there was one that was sung. Then there was one that was sung that I really didn't like. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Do not pass me by. Do you remember that, Betty? Well, for a good while I thought, what in the world are they singing about Jesus passing people by for? He ain't passing nobody by. He wants everybody to get saved. But whoever wrote that song understood what I'm preaching today. And I found out there's a lot of real good things in those hymns. 
Now, you know what? God just kind of paced that whole song so I just understand it last night when I was meditating on this word. Whoever wrote it read these scriptures about how Jesus did pass right on by some whole cities. And there were one man, a blind man, got healed. And nobody else got a touch from God. Why? Because only one man responded. Only one man pulled on his anointing. Do not pass me by. Jesus is walking all up and down these aisles this morning. He's walking past your aisle in the form of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. What do you have need of? What are you really tired of happening in your life and you want to see the cycle of broken? What is it in you that bugs you? What addiction needs to be broken? What sin is it that kind of makes you feel like you're a little inferior as a Christian? What is it that you believe in God for that's so big that you just need to get over being depressed over so you can get on with your life and watch what God does? You need to respond to him better than you've been responding or if you had already been responding right, the need would have already been taken care of. Amen? Amen? So we need to consider what that response needs to be. As Christians, in our lives, we need to be very concerned that we don't allow the moving of the Holy Spirit and the hand of the miraculous to pass us by. Some people would have lived a longer life, a happier life, a more fulfilled life, and a life to where they actually got some things done that they had in their heart to do and finished it and finished it good if they just responded to his passing by. It's not that Jesus is not passing by. It's that we need to consider our response. <clears throat> you know, there are so many people who choose to respond to certain things and choose not to respond to others. Now, the Bible tells us to be unresponsive to certain things. For instance, it says in Romans, to reckon yourself dead to sin. That means consider yourself to be unresponsive to sin in the sinful nature. Huh? Dead to it. That means irresponsive. You can take one of those magazines of pornography and hold it in a man's face as dead all you want to. It's irresponsive. Dead to it. See, some people say, I can't respond well in church because... You know, I just don't respond very well. I'm just not very emotional. Well, you followed him home that Sunday afternoon and watched him watch the ball game on TV. And he gets really excited about that ball game. Huh? Hey, this one woman, I said, you know, I noticed that for the past few weeks, your husband is not being very responsive in church. Like, don't light up at all. Don't nod his head at all. Don't look like he's receiving anything. Just not responsive. And she said, well, he's not a very responsive person. So I'm praying about it. I said, Lord, what's wrong with him? He needs to get freed up in his spirit. He's not responsive. He says, no, he's responsive. He's just chosen not to be responsive to me. You choose who you can respond to, what you're going to respond to. That means every time we come to church, we can choose to be a very responsive, alive group of people who get connected with God in worship and praise and the moving of the Holy Spirit, responsive in the ministry of the Word, where every now and then if I say something right, you say amen. Amen? To where you are engaging. To where you are interacting. To where the Bible says we are lively stones. Amen? We are 
filled with the water of the river of the Holy Spirit springing up on the inside of us. We're not a dead swamp. We are an alive river because he lives on the inside of us. But you've got to tap into that. You've got to acknowledge that. You've got to see yourself as that kind of person and get over what you think poor old people is going to think about you anyway. Now, if you're concerned about what we think of you, I wonder how stiff you're going to be out there with everybody else. If you're all concerned about what we think and hear about you, then you're going to be chicken out there sharing anything about Jesus or showing anything about Jesus in your life to the people out here in the world. Amen? You are going to need to consider what you can do differently to respond better when Jesus passes by. Sometimes Jesus is really passing by pretty strong while you're reading the Bible or hearing his word while you're getting ready for work. It's going to be up to you to just let it be a mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm, thinking about everything else while it's being read. Huh? Or you can just sit there and hear it and just stop it and say, and just get blessed there for a while. I mean, sometimes I listen to three, four, five chapters, and one verse out of those five chapters sets me on fire a little bit. And I respond to it, and I'll make a confession out of it, or I'll pray and say something to the Lord, or I'll rise up a little bit stronger by saying, this is the truth about the matter. Amen. Are you hearing me? That's what you need to be able to do. There's nothing humdrum or dead or in the rut about following Jesus, but it is if you're following religion. Amen. <laughs> oh, I'm just peeling back some onions today, but that's okay. I mean, you're certainly here because you want it peeled back, right? You could have gone to the first church in the fridge there and just gone out with a nice singing song, nice sermon, but nice but not changed. Amen? Yeah. But here we are today wanting to know about how God really wants us to live. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He wants you to be free. He wants you to choose to respond to him. Amen? You need to be very sincere and sensitive to the Holy Spirit to make sure you don't miss out on his moving upon your hearts and blessing us and changing us. Amen? You see, what you, what, my question is, what have you missed in situations that should have been benefited from his mighty hand? What could, how many times have you passed by that you could have benefited? That you weren't thinking spiritual? You weren't aggressively pursuing? You're just sitting there thinking about other things. That's why you shouldn't be checking your Facebook and emails and texts and everything while you're at church. Because the devil wants you not to ever respond properly in order to benefit from being at church. Amen. It's okay to be here, but just don't really be here all the way. Are you with me? Just be here halfway. Your body's here. Just filling up the chair alone ain't going to do anything you got to get it, your whole being here. Amen? Yes. See, what have you missed out on because of your lack of passion? We cannot afford to be distracted while God is moving, while his presence and power is passing by. When God's presence and power is passing by, here's the question. What causes him to stand still for us? What causes him to stand still? For us. A little bit ahead on the screen, so just take that off, please. Desperation. Desperation. If a person is in desperation, this moves God. Let me just talk about desperation. I like that song, I, I'm desperate for you. Know that song? The reason why I like it is because it's what it takes so many times to experience the hand of God in a personal way for him to move for you. Change the situation. Desperation for most of us means we're gone down for the third time. Desperation means I went to see the doctor and he told you you're going to die. Desperation is you lost your job, buddy. You're taking your car away. Your wife just left you. Your family just left you. Your dog just left you, man. You lost your house. That's desperation. But that is not the kind of desperation that I'm talking about. 
I don't believe you need to be at that place in order to respond. But unfortunately, so many people in this culture don't see desperation until it turns to something like that. Desperation should be simply based on this fact. I really am nothing without you, lost without you, and can't get my answers, my breakthroughs without you, can't fulfill my life assignment without you, can't progress without you, can't get blessed without you, can't get healed without you. I just need you, period, for all of these things. Amen? And when you know that, then you are not going to just sit by, stand by, and get passed by. Amen? You're going to get up and do something. You're going to get up and take a, a strong stand. You see, there has to be a certain level of passion for God that gets his attention. What did the blind man do? He cried out. <laughs> Hardly nobody wants to cry out anymore. It might scare a few people in church. I'll tell you what it might scare. It might scare a few devils. Amen? It might scare a few devils, you know. They cried out. Well, I'm not really a shouter. Well, this tells me you're going to lose out on a lot of things in life. First of all, the Bible says shout for joy, which means there's sometimes you'll never get joy unless you shout to get it because you don't just shout because you're happy. You've got to shout for it sometimes. Amen. Shouting is powerful. It's loaded all the way through the scripture how people shout it. They shout it when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. They shout it. They shout it. It's not just in the Old Testament. It's everywhere. Whenever people shouted, cried out, lifted their voice as an expression of their desperation, their passion, and their faith for God, then God, who is moving, stops. The guy couldn't see this. He was blind. But I wish I was in the crowd to see. Jesus in the crowd moving. When the man said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and turned his head. And I believe he's got blue eyes. When those eyes locked in, I wish I could see that. The crowd saw it. He was on his way somewhere else. He was just passing through. Just passing by. Goes through the city, out the other side, and gone. But when he heard that, he stopped and turned his head. How many of you want to just stop him and turn his head towards you? My God, what you going to do to get him to do that? Chew, man. He'd have stopped. He's gone. But I love the Lord and I love his presence. That's not good enough for you. That's not good enough for me. I think we do well to cry out more often. I think we do well to be a, a stronger shouting church. A loud praising church. And stop all this quiet stuff. This ain't no dead church. Sometimes I come in here and I think, my God, is the only person going to shout today going to be me and a few other people? Do you have to be instructed to shout? Let's all shout now. One, two, three. Just to, just to blast it out, you know. Just to kind of shake up the atmosphere and blow a few devils out and bring the glory in so he'll stop and look our way because there's a lot of churches worshiping today. And some of them never get the look. Some of them never get the look. God, ultimate life church, we want the look. Oh, we want the look. We want you to turn your eyes toward us. We want you to shine your grace and mercy on us. We want the power, the anointing, the fire, the glory of God in this church. Do not pass me by, oh gentle Savior. 
God. I love it, oh him now. It's gone. We don't sing it in church no more. Some of y'all never even knew what it was. Never heard of it. But it's a good one. Because it sure tells the way it is. Hear my humble cry. All on others thou art calling. But do not pass me by. I can't stand the thought of it. I can't stand the thought of it. But I know, if I'm going to be honest with myself, there was times and have been times where he's passed me by and I didn't respond right. I wasn't sensitive enough. I'm thinking about some other stupid thing in church like, what am I going to do afterwards? We're going to go eat. Let's go text one of my friends, see if we can meet up. And we, even in the moment, we're just living the happy, blessed life and think that we're on the trail for God's best when we are called to be more and we did not stay awake, alert, and cry out to God because we didn't hardly notice, feel nothing because we didn't put nothing into it. We weren't sensitive. How many of y'all are here in the Spirit of God this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, I got to cry out. Got to cry out. You got to lift your voice. This isn't the popular message. This is not what the top 10 preachers are preaching about today because it's all about secret friendly stuff. I'm just telling you, God wants us to cry out. You better start practicing crying out at home a little bit more. Well, what do my kids think? What will my family think? You know what they'll think? They'll think somebody is serious about getting a hold of God in this household. Maybe we ought to. They put the fear of God in your place instead of just mediocre mess and where everything and anything goes on that just frustrates you all the time, wish you could stop it, don't know how. Amen? Desperation. The disciples were in the boat and they cried out, and the Bible says that he would have passed them by. But why did he not pass them by? They did the same thing the blind man did. They cried out. What about me over here? God, help me. No, he's not hard of hearing. But he's looking at somebody going to do something. So respond and get up and lay claims to their healing and take a stand for what the word of God says and just go ahead and lay claims to what you believe in he's got for you and don't wait for no someday. Today, I'm laying a hold to God. Today, I know he's passing by and I am going to cry out today. Yeah, you, you can know pretty much what I'm going to be doing at the end of this sermon. Right up here. Because this is what's needed, and I'm going to do it right while he's passing by in this atmosphere with us here today. And you need to do it too, for your sake. And let him know what you're crying out to him for. So he calls the man over. Son of man, son of David, have mercy on me. He, he gives him the look. He comes over, and he says this. What do you want me to do for you? <laughs> the man is blind. What? <laughs> Have you ever wondered why he would ask such a question? Because he wanted to find out where the man's faith was. He might have had a need where something was wrong with one of his family. He was a beggar. Maybe he just needed some more money. Whatever he needs, he cries out first. Jesus stops, gives him the look, calls him over. What do you want? He says it, and those words were enough to release his healing. Hallelujah. Amen. 
That tells me it's a formula for all of us that will work the same way. When you cry out to God, don't just cry out to Him in worship. Cry out to Him and tell Him what you'd like for Him to do for you, what you're believing for, and release your faith on it. Amen. <laughs> Got to cry out. Jesus, He would have passed up His own disciples in distress. You mean you let him, Jesus would have just walked on by having this wonderful walk on the water, just having fun, and left those guys out there fighting the waves all night? Yeah. In fact, would it take for them to learn their lesson? Sounds familiar, don't it? How many of us out there fighting on the waves, man? Just fighting the waves. <laughs> you ain't got to fight the waves. But you are going to need to cry out if you want to stop fighting the waves waves I don't think they were fighting the waves so much they're about to die that there were a time there was a time when they thought they were going to die he's asleep in the boat and he and they cry out cried out for him but this time it wasn't a life or death situation they're just toiled wore out trying to paddle the boat against all the wacky waves it was just a rough sea but not a one that could kill you Jesus would have just passed them on by and said knock yourselves out guys I'm having fun tonight Walking on by. Maybe just got up a little trot here and just speeded on like I saw him doing a movie, man, all the way to the shore, you know, having a little water flying up behind him. But while he's walking, he hears them cry out. He hears them cry out, and then he goes over and gets in the boat with them, and they said they're, they're tired of the waves and all that mess, and as soon as he steps on the boat, the water just goes like glass. No more waves. Come on, somebody lift your hand and say, that's pretty cool, Jesus. Come on. Or say, thank you, Lord, or something. Wow, hallelujah, whoa, whoa. Man, that's cool. Amen. So Jesus, in the form of the Holy Spirit, is always passing by. It is more noticeable and obvious that he's passing by in certain places and atmospheres. It's up to you to be determined not to just go through the motions of religious activity while you're in church. It's up to you not to just stand there and sit there casually, singing songs and not reaching from your heart with a passion for God. What causes him to stop and benefit you while he is passing by? We, we talked about crying out. What else? We've got a few more things. You headed up earlier. Let's get it on the screen again. It's your faith. Everybody say, my faith. And faith, the Bible says, is dead. I mean, uh, it's, it's dead without works. Works means you got to do something. Huh? Faith without works is dead, which means it's going to require you to do something. The woman had to go toward Jesus and touch his garment. The blind man had to cry out and go toward him, had somebody lead him by the hand to do it. The disciples had to cry out. The woman had to make him a room. You see, every one of us got to consider what is it that we need to do to demonstrate our faith. Also, what caused them to stop to benefit us is you being real with God. Everybody say real with God. It takes you being real with God for him to stop. He, he knows phonies. He knows a phony heart. He knows that when you're not, you don't mean it. He knows that when you're just playing around, just saying his name without any thought involved. And also, it's, he, move, he stops his moving and looks your direction. It's more than just uh, uh, watching the river is jumping into the river. Amen? You can't just keep watching the river go by. You've got to jump into the river, which means you've got to get yourself engaged. Some of y'all can dance. Some of y'all can move. And some of y'all can actually stand up for the whole worship service and not sit down. I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm just going to stand up. I'm going to do something. I'm going to show God i got faith. I'm going to stay engaged. I want to do something. Now, if you're just to the place where your knees don't work, we'll pray for you. But I'm just telling you, I do my very best to put forth my best energies in the house of God. If I could work all week, I'm going to come in and stand up and worship God. I worship, dance, shout, do everything. Still stand up here, preach the whole message, and go out of here, and still I'm fine. I take a nap during the day. It's my custom. But I, put, I pace my energies 
for what matters, and that's to worship God, to be in his house. Not because I'm a pastor. I did it before I was a pastor. Because I'm a lover of God. I'm a lover of his presence. I mean what I sang today. Amen? Praise the Lord. You see, there are reasons why the Holy Spirit stops passing by and begins to move in a service. Sometimes it only takes a few people who are reaching with desperation and crying out to God with a passion for him, releasing their faith and determined to get a hold of his garment. If several would do it, I said if several would do it, if many would do it, if the whole church would do it, God would see that room was made for the miraculous. It's not my anointed sermons that's going to bring the miraculous. It's not just the anointed music, though we've got anointed music and we have anointed sermons. It's going to take some people who acknowledge the anointing in them and will respond accordingly. Sometimes, you know, it takes just a few to get it going. But yet, it's going to be up to everyone else to respond when the outbreak takes place. God would show up in situations like that stronger. Everyone would then greatly benefit. The church of people that's reaching and worshiping and crying out to God would enjoy a wonderful atmosphere. And the world, when they see something like that, they call it an atmosphere of energy. Oh, they got high energy. Now, I, know, I have known of some churches that are just putting on a show. Actually, I don't know where they went lately, but now they just got a bunch of calm people in crowds with a lot of exciting music that nobody responds to hardly, unless it's a few young people who just kind of get into it, and they're going to wave their hand and clap, even if it's rock and roll. Amen? You hearing me? I'm talking about in the spirit. See, whenever we get into this flow that I'm talking about, it's not just an atmosphere of energy. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of God. I want to just close by telling you a story about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a short man. He wanted to see Jesus when he was passing by. Remember that story? So the crowds are all gathered. Jesus is passing by. And I really believe that Jesus was passing through cities just to see who would respond. And this man who was short, he wanted to see Jesus, and he had some expectations of what would happen if he could just see him. Since he was short, he had to do, some, do something. He was passionate enough to do something. Amen? So he climbed up in a tree, and the tree represents his level of expectation. It's his expression of his faith. It's something he did to show that he was willing to put forth an effort on his part to respond to Jesus to get his attention. Jesus saw his passion and went to his house and blessed his entire household. You know that story? And some of you need to realize that the entire future of your whole family would change if you just get up in a tree. Amen. Amen. While Jesus is passing by today, if you would just get in the tree, Jesus will come and meet you there and he will take you home and be with you at home and bless and shake up your whole family. Amen. Change your whole household. If you will just get in the tree, you will not be taking depression home with you today. It just so happens to be that Jesus and depression don't go to the same place. Amen. Notice the story with the blind man. He noticed that Jesus was passing by. He cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The religious people, they tried to calm him down. You know, there will always be some people who will try to calm down a legitimate move of God. Did you hear me? They want everything quiet. Everything dull. And everybody remaining in need. Nobody really changing. But Jesus keep on passing by. We're having and enjoying a wonderful sweet presence. But no lives really change. But the blind man cried out. And when they tried to get him to stop 
and be quiet. The Bible says he cried out even the more with a loud voice, which means he was saying, forget you. You don't know my pain. You don't know my struggles. You don't understand my level of faith. You don't know what I've been through. You want me to be quiet? I don't think so. Hallelujah. He lifted his voice and cried out even louder. Amen. I wonder how loud you can cry out. I wonder how loud you can just say, Jesus, I'm tired of this mess, whatever it is that you're dealing with. And you're just waiting for someday him to pass by and just some right situation you're waiting for where everything is just so-so to where you can respond. I want to let you know something. The right situation, the right sermon, and the right spirit and the right atmosphere has been set for you today. If you ain't going to do it today, I want to know when you're going to do it. Amen? Hallelujah. you got to learn to lift your voice. This guy, it's a play on words, he got a miracle for crying out loud. <laughs> and some people are too bashful, too shy to even get a miracle. Oh, they believe in a God of miracles. They want a miracle. They say they believe in for a miracle. But they don't do what it takes to get a miracle. Amen? Don't let that happen to you. You see, when you're desperate, when you're passionate, when you release your faith, there are times that you just need to lift your voice and get loud, and then the Lord will stop. You get his attention, and he'll whip his eyes in your direction. The church has gotten too composed, too casual, too laid back, too professional, too passionate, too passive, and the church is treated too much like a spectator sport. And the church where the Spirit of God moves and the people benefits requires you to not be a spectator, but to be an interactive participant. Look at your neighbor and say, I am an interactive participant. You see, it's up to you to reach out and touch him. And there's something about a shout. And don't think someone is being a little bit too emotional just because they cry out to God and lift up their voice in a shout. The blind man received his miracle right after the shout. And sometimes you're just only one hallelujah away from the greatest miracle of your life. Amen? Amen. Think of it. The blind man caused the Son of God to stand still. You mean if I learn to worship and I learn to praise, I learn to express myself and express my desperation for Jesus and cry out in faith that he will stand still for me and look my direction. Everybody look at me. I want to see your eyes. Yes. Yes. He wants to prove himself to you. He wants to do it. Amen. The Bible says in many accounts that while Jesus was on his way to somewhere else, somebody cried out and Jesus stopped. And he looked their way and gave them his personal attention. And he is still doing that, and he will do that for you. Today, Jesus is passing by. Do you have a need? Jesus is passing by. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Oh, <laughs> Shebron Let's all stand up and praise the worship team, take the stage, and let's get here around this altar and present our knees and whatever God's going to do, he, he needs to do it today.